Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove and this is part two of our three-part series on the integral yoga of Sri Aurobindo. With me is Dr. Debashish Banerjee, who is the academic dean at the University of Philosophical Research in Los Angeles. He is also an adjunct faculty member at Pasadena City College and the California Institute of Integral Studies. In addition, he is the author of Seven Quartets of Becoming, a transformative yoga psychology based on the diaries of Sri Aurobindo. He has also written The Alternative Nation of Abhinindranath Tagore, his great-grandfather, and Rabindranath Tagore in the 21st Century, an anthology about his great-uncle. Welcome, Devashish. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, in our first part of this series, we talked about Aurobindo's gradual conversion from a political revolutionary to what I think we could justly call a spiritual revolutionary. Quite, quite true. Absolutely. I think it's, that's a good uh, phrase. Mm -hmm. And at some point, he basically gave up uh, his political activities and retired to uh, spiritual seclusion, more or less, in mm -hmm. Pondicherry. Mm -hmm. Yes, quite true. So after the jail uh, incident or episode, mm -hmm. um, he was released and he came out and he continued for a little while uh, in Calcutta. Um, he was editing a journal, uh, a revolutionary journal. Um, and uh, continuing to work with his uh, compatriots, uh, nationalists. Mm, not all of it was terrorism. It was mm -hmm. uh, a, lo a lot of it was about reform and about informing uh, Indians, mm -hmm. uh, inspiring them. So that went on for a little while more, not, not for more than a year. And <clears throat> then he got wind of the fact that the British wanted to deport him. Mm -hmm. They were trying to catch him again on some ground or the other. And uh, then in his, in his own records, he, he claims that he received a, a, what he calls an adesh, in other words, a directive mm -hmm. from within, an intuitive uh, kind of uh, uh, state uh, kind of uh, directive. Well, he already felt that he was establishing a personal relationship with uh, God in the exactly. form of Krishna. Of, in the God in the form of Krishna, right. And so he received a directive from within that asked him to go to a French-occupied town called Chandanagar, which was close to Calcutta. So he moved there and stayed there for a little while and then got another directive to move to Pondicherry, which was also French occupied, but much further away mm -hmm. in South India. And he went there and uh, left uh, his uh, political activities mm -hmm. and uh, went, uh, so to say, into seclusion uh, with a small band of followers. Mm -hmm. uh, they were all revolutionaries who were with him during the nationalist uh, activity. Mm -hmm. And now they uh, surrounded him and lived with him as his disciples. So he lived in Pondicherry from 1910 to 1950 for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. Actually, when he went there, he didn't go there fully deciding to leave politics. His uh, idea, his, his personal, uh, his thought was that he will progress spiritually to a certain point where he'll be capable of coming back into politics mm -hmm. with the gains that he made spiritually to further the political cause. In other words, he saw that some of the spiritual powers yes. that he was acquiring through yoga mm -hmm. could be applied uh, yes. for political purposes. Yes, exactly. 
But uh, in his own terms, uh, that never came to pass. Mm -hmm. His spiritual uh, spiritual journey continued till till his very end in mm -hmm. 1950. So, and he, he began to uh, keep careful diaries. Yes, he started keeping his diaries from about 1912, mm -hmm. and uh, from 1912 to 1920 or so, he kept these diaries in which he very meticulously records uh, his experiences and his attempts uh, to progress in, in a variety of disciplines that he was mm -hmm. uh, carrying out. And during this period, he uh, received a certain kind of a, a, what he calls a program mm -hmm. uh, for his own spiritual uh, growth. And that is what uh, has been uh, translated as seven quartets of becoming. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the term that he used, it, these diaries are very interesting because they are a hybrid Sanskrit English that he's writing. It's, mm -hmm. it's peppered with English and Sanskrit words. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the first page, the one of the earliest uh, diaries, um, has the notation Sapta Chatushtaya which uh, ha it can be translated as seven quartets, mm -hmm. seven sets of fours. Mm -hmm. So these seven sets of fours relate to the goals that he set to himself. And in each goal, there were four sub-goals, mm -hmm. four uh, siddhis, as he called them, uh, achievements. And that's what he was uh, practicing. So it's a very extensive, detailed system of uh, yoga, and he um, is practicing it for himself at, right. at this point and keeping a very detailed diary in right. both English and Sanskrit, and, yeah. uh, incorporating his experiences. He began to experience various paranormal phenomena that, right. that he uh, tested in various ways. Yes, he would test each one of these. Uh, they had to do with telepathic powers, uh, as well as uh, powers of, uh, which all can also be called telepathic, of influencing people and events mm -hmm. and things like that, receiving and influencing. I understand he began really by studying uh, animals, birds in, in the Whatever vicinity. Whatever was in his vicinity, yeah. ants, uh, uh -huh. ants, crows, butterflies, and uh, people moving around. He would uh, carefully keep notes of uh, how he would be able to predict what they're doing, or uh, he'd be able to change uh, what he thought they were doing, etc. In other words, to influence them telepathically. Influence them, uh, yeah, on, on the one hand to receive and on the other hand to influence. Mm -hmm. And it, at some point, he even went so far as to see if he could influence large-scale political events. Exactly. In these diaries themselves, so this is happening, the diaries are going through the period of the First World War, as, as you may uh, see, mm -hmm. because 1912 to 1920. Yes. And uh, he has records there of uh, things that he's trying to uh, receive. And, mm -hmm. uh, something is happening in Turkey, or something is happening somewhere else in the theater of war. And he makes a record, and then next day he checks against the newspaper to see whether that really has happened or not. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it's not always uh, he, he's very meticulous. It's not always that he, he succeeds. Mm -hmm. When he fails, he notes the fact that he failed. Uh, and the other activity is trying to influence things and then predicting that this is probably going to happen and then noting whether that really happened or not. Mm -hmm. Well, I think this is very interesting because as an individual evolves spiritually, it's normal, I think, for people to encounter healing. Yes. abilities. People who are spiritually evolved have a, a natural healing yes. capacity, I yes. think. And once you begin to recognize that, it's natural to think, can I apply that healing to the whole planet? Because sure. humanity has been, uh, since ancient times, um, prone to uh, warfare, prone yes prone to social problems that right. cause a great deal of suffering. And yes. a spiritually inclined person who might imagine that they have some healing abilities would, would want to 
apply that to the planet. Otherwise, uh, one might think of oneself as having failed in one's potential. Yes, mm -hmm. it's quite true. In fact, after his first experience of the unreality, one of the f comments he made mm -hmm. is uh, a spiritual liberation that left the world as it was, was felt by me to be distasteful. Mm -hmm. In other words, it couldn't satisfy him. Uh, the experience of the world as a world of shadows where he couldn't do anything yes. about it. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, th the other experiences that he had uh, supplemented that first experience and gave him a sense of the reality of the world. Um, of course, as an appearance, but nevertheless with a meaning to it mm -hmm. that he felt was he was justified in wanting to transform it and make it better. And the paradox here, as I understand yeah. it, is that in, in Vedanta yes. philosophy, it is it believed that the ultimate nature of the universe mm. is bliss, yes. pure bliss. That yes. Everything is already perfect, as awful as it might seem yes, at yes, times. Yes. It's really perfect. Yes, yes, yes. So how do you reconcile that? How did Aurobindo reconcile yeah. that with his desire to influence things Quite. politically? Right. So, <clears throat> you're absolutely right. So, you know, the three kinds of experiences uh, that he had uh, before he went to Pondicherry, mm -hmm. uh, each one of these experiences is one particular interpretation of Vedanta. Mm -hmm. So, the first one which uh, sees the world as unreality, that is uh, the interpretation of Advaita Vedanta. Uh, there is another view called Vishishtadvaita, or qualified non-dualism, mm -hmm. that sees everything as the energy uh, manifestation of Brahman. Mm -hmm. And it says you cannot know Brahman outside its manifestation. Mm -hmm. Everything is already uh, Brahman that's manifesting. Mm -hmm. And because there is the veil of Maya, we don't see that it is blissful. We laugh and cry and we have sorrows and yes. all that. But yes. ultimately behind it, the divine is always in bliss. These are all forms of the divine's enjoyment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the third uh, kind of interpretation of Vedanta is the Vaishnavite, uh, Vaish Vishnu followers. And they feel that uh, Brahman is a person, it's Krishna. And Krishna uh, is present in all things, which is the third mm -hmm. major experience he had. So he was to reconcile this condition by saying that these are all valid uh, descriptions of mm -hmm. reality. Simultaneously uh, all valid. Simultaneously all valid. But we don't experience them simultaneously because of the nature of mind. A mind deals with contradictions. If one is true, its opposite cannot be true. Uh, so if we can give one particular description, you can't have any other description to the same thing. Mm -hmm. So he was to say that human beings have to evolve to a point where we go bypass, we, we uh, overpass the mind, mm -hmm. transcend the mind. But it's not by jumping into another consciousness which leaves the mind behind but by gradually adding to our present capacities, enlarging them, mm -hmm. uh, and then coming to a point, uh, you know, something like an omega point, where you jump to that other dimension. Uh -huh. But from that other dimension, you can control, or can have uh, full con uh, contact with, with uh, all the rest of uh, what you experienced. This is the heart of what we mean by integral yoga. Right, right. So that simultaneity of all these uh, experiences could be had at the same time. You could, you could have a multi-dimensional experience of reality if you were in what he was to call supermind. Mm -hmm. That is uh, the, the plane of consciousness that he's talking about. Mm -hmm. So everything is blissful from, say, the plane of supermind, but it is not so to us. And so the only way by which we could take the veil and yet have a life here, what he was to call the divine life, the life divine, mm -hmm. is if we progressed or if we evolved in consciousness 
to the point that we could experience that and at the same time lead our lives. Now, I think it's quite interesting that almost simultaneously in yeah. Switzerland, yes. Carl Jung mm -hmm. is developing a psychology based on the notion of integration. Quite true, quite true. Integration and also his integration, his individuation is a universalizing process. Mm -hmm. And so in, in the case of Aurobindo as well, you find that what he's talking about is the present capacity of the human mind has reached a point where if we just go a little higher mm -hmm. or we start contacting realms of cosmic mind which are universal. Mm -hmm. So we are even today we can see the knowledge explosion that humanity is going mm -hmm. through and we are consolidating all the knowledge of the past. Mm -hmm. Our universities are great archives of all the knowledge of the past. And it's available to everybody today through devices like the internet. Yes. So his idea was that uh, we could, great philosophers of the past were drawing from these cosmic planes. Mm -hmm. And they were getting these grand universal schemes by which they could explain mm -hmm. everything. But they were different schemes. So you had different philosophies. Yeah. It was a relativistic mm -hmm. uh, world, it seemed. So it seemed. So this plane of cosmic mind he called higher mind. Mm -hmm. But there was a plane even b beyond that, which I feel is similar to what Carl Jung is calling the world of archetypes. Mm -hmm. He uses the term collective unconscious. Yes. But this is also a universal plane of mind in which we uh, encounter symbols mm -hmm. that uh, have a general uh, validity all o for all of uh, humanity. Yes. And so this world of illuminations, uh, he called the illumined mind. Mm -hmm. That was one rung higher than the higher mind. So the main difference, it yeah. would seem, between Aurobindo's integral yoga yeah. and Carl Jung's uh, dynamic psychology right. is um, that Jung was drawing on the uh, thousands of years of history of yoga technique and technology, and right. Jung was drawing on the uh, more recent uh, developments in hypnosis and in uh, psychoanalysis and uh, psychotherapy. Right, right. Yeah, you mean Aurobindo was drawing on the yoga tradition. Yeah, yeah. did I say uh, it? Uh, <laughs> you, you said Jung in both cases. Oh. But, but yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, that's fine. So, yeah, so th these are the planes and then, then there is a plane that he called intuition mm -hmm. where he says that we begin to have direct contact with things. We know things as they are mm -hmm. by becoming those things. Mm -hmm. So even what we normally call intuition, even empathy for that matter, is a form of direct contact. We come really close to somebody, we start feeling their feelings. Mm -hmm. So that those types of experiences belong to a plane of consciousness that he calls intuition, where we are coming really close to identifying with others because of the principle of identity, mm -hmm. the, which is Brahman. Uh, so that is the last cusp beyond which what he called supermind was to be found. Mm -hmm. So it, it developing an intuitive mentality, a, a, a widespread integral intuition is one of his uh, teachings mm -hmm. to come closer to the supermind. Now this differs from traditional Vedanta in some ways, does it not? Yeah, it does differ. Well, one of the differences is, as I said, uh, Vedanta lends itself to a number of interpretations, all of them correct. Yeah. Um, and if you really look at the Vedantic literature, you'll see, it, which, which is what he does, he reinterprets the Vedanta to show that the idea of supermind, etc., which in the Vedanta is called Vijnana, is present in it. Mm -hmm. But it had been um, ignored by later commentators. Uh -huh. And so in that sense, uh, it seems as if he's adding something new. Yeah. Well, okay, my sense here, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, traditionally mm -hmm. Vedanta and yoga didn't contain the notion of progress, which is, uh, I think, a Quite Western right. notion. And, and in effect, that's what Aurobindo, it, it, 
introduced is, is the idea that we can progress farther than the sages and rishis and yogis of the past even envisioned. Quite right, absolutely. Also, they were looking at it purely individually. Mm -hmm. So an individual could uh, open up certain latent powers yes. or come into contact with other forms of consciousness, mm -hmm. but they never thought about it as uh, something that was uh, for the whole human race. Mm -hmm. While he was saying that uh, this is a kind of a per Vivekananda made the point that yoga is nothing but accelerated evolution accelerated evolution. evolution yeah that's yeah. one of his sentences mm -hmm. and uh, but he was thinking about the individual and in tantra there is the idea that we have different centers of consciousness the chakras the chakras yeah. yes and that uh, our consciousness can reside at these different centers mm -hmm. open up their powers or even evolve from one center to another and ultimately uh, go to uh, center above the head. Mm -hmm. uh, Aurobindo was saying that uh, what, can, what was asserted of the individual and tantra is also true of the race, mm -hmm. that as a race, humanity is evolving, mm -hmm. and that we've come to a point where we can open up uh, new realms of cosmic consciousness, um, not only for the individual, but for groups of individuals, and ultimately uh, an entire subsection of the species. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually, uh, Aurobindo established an ashram and a, a center, a spiritual community where uh, people began to uh, practice the forms of yoga, although I understand it's not prescriptive, like no. some forms of where you do hatha yoga in a certain yeah. sequence, it yeah. wasn't like that at all. No. So in 1914, he was joined by a French couple, mm -hmm. uh, a, a French uh, f philosopher, teacher called Paul Richard and his mm -hmm. wife, mm -hmm. uh, Mira Alfasa. Mm -hmm. And um, later in 1920, Mira came to stay with uh, Sri Aurobindo and became his uh, collaborator mm -hmm. and partner, spiritual partner. And uh, he designated her as the mother. Mm -hmm. And an ashram grew up around them uh, with her uh, being the main teacher. I see. And uh, he was uh, continuing to explore uh, these realms of consciousness and uh, make them available to his disciples. And so that kind of uh, situation arose uh, mm -hmm. later in his life. Yes. But the, the point that I was uh, thinking about, that, that it wasn't prescriptive. Yes, that, that's very important, Jeffrey. Mm -hmm. It certainly wasn't prescriptive because he felt that every individual ha was unique and every they, they had to have their own unique unfoldment. Mm -hmm. And so um, <coughs> he did talk about certain philosophical uh, goals, mm -hmm. uh, like we talked about those interpretations, talked about planes of consciousness. Yes. He gave a psychology, mm -hmm. which is what the yoga psychology of Sri Aurobindo is all about, mm -hmm. uh, that can be thought both in structural terms and in process terms. Mm -hmm. uh, in structural terms, you can give a description of uh, some part of it coincident uh, with uh, the tantric idea of the chakras. Yes. Um, but one of the kind of uh, major differences is that in Tantra, you cause the Shakti to rise from below the spine mm -hmm. and rise up the Kundalini above. Mm -hmm. uh, while in uh, uh, activating each chakra uh, along the way. Activating each chakra on, uh, on the way. Yes. Uh, while in Aurobindo's case, um, on the one hand, what he's prescribing is not a kind of a samadhi or trance uh, of consciousness above the head, mm -hmm. but a waking state in which those powers can be had uh, to their fullest in our everyday life. Uh, so he is saying that what happens is that the consciousness goes to sleep in the thousand petal lotus. Mm -hmm. But human evolution has brought us to a certain point now where the thousand petal lotus is more available to human beings than it was before. Mm -hmm. um, as we can see, we discussed how um, you know, universal knowledge is becoming. Let's define for our viewers the yeah. thousand-petaled lotus. Uh, yeah, I'm sure sorry. not everyone is familiar yes, with that yes, term. Yes, yes, yes. 
So in the tantric system, you have these uh, centers of consciousness um, and they run up the spine, mm -hmm. but the highest center is a little above the head and it's called the thousand petal lotus mm -hmm. because it's, a, it's, it's, it's like a kind of a bud mm -hmm. uh, that when it opens up, it uh, gives uh, enormous universal knowledge. The Svahasrara chakra. Svahasrara chakra, right. Yes. So normally the idea is that you go into samadhi in that uh, chakra, you go into deep trance. Mm -hmm. Uh, but what he was saying is that uh, universal knowledge is much more available to us today due to the evolution of knowledge and that in a way from an occult point of view uh, we can receive influences from that uh, center mm -hmm. if we were just to um, open ourselves to it, be receptive to it, call on it. Mm -hmm. And so in his system, uh, the energy comes down, descends from above mm -hmm. into a mind that, that has prepared itself through silence, uh, through, through quietude, meditation. Uh, it comes down and as it comes down, it opens up the different chakras, which then, um, you know, so it's a top down process rather than a bottom up process. I, I, and also he seems to be saying that it's, these experiences are not just for meditation, but they are uh, for our everyday waking consciousness active in the world. Right, uh, absolutely. And this customized approach that you were talking about, that the, every individual is different and mm -hmm. uh, you don't have a prescriptive method. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was saying that um, individuals have to, like himself, they had to open to their own divine guide within. Each mm -hmm. one of us has a teacher inside us. So this is the d deep inside the soul, what, the, what he called the psychic being. So to become open to the leading of the psychic being, first just as an influence, but gradually as we become more aware of its, you know, I mean, he has even connected it to the idea of the Socratic daemon. The daemon of Socrates. Of Socrates. Yes. Mm -hmm. that Socrates used to listen to his daemon, yes. but one has to prepare oneself to listen to that voice. Mm -hmm. So, but as one becomes more and more uh, aware of that, uh, that lead becomes the lead leader of the yoga. Mm -hmm. And one doesn't, uh, no, there's nothing prescribed, it tells you what to do. I see. Well, Debashish Banerjee, we've uh, run out of time. Sure. Uh, thank you so much for being with me. Thank you, Jeffrey. And thank you for being with us. Be sure to check your listings for part three of our three-part series on the integral yoga of Sri Aurobindo, where we'll be discussing Aurobindo's vision for the future of humanity. <laughs> ¶¶